The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did for science. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. What the? What the? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. And he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. Real Local, WGSR 47.1 in high definition. to a word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you and we are glad that you are, are with us tonight. We're going to be studying uh, uh, another lesson from God's Word. We're actually going to be talking about what our job really is. What, what is the job of a gospel preacher? What do uh, what is it that uh, uh, Mark and Micah and Johnny and James what is it that we do? Uh, that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight but uh, we first want to uh, give you our content information. Here's how you can reach me. 
Uh, we meet at 250 Boulevard there in Eden, North Carolina. You can reach me at 276-340-2653. Word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email. And if you'd like a copy of this program, we'll be glad to get that out to you. We hope you'll come out and visit with us. Uh, our Bible studies on Thursday nights at 7 uh, p.m. And Sundays we meet at uh, 9 for Bible study and 10 for worship. Uh, we actually had some visitors uh, Sunday that came out. We're glad they, they came. Um, the, the, the folks in Martinsville and Danville, they meet at 10 and 11 o'clock. And we meet at 9 and 10 o'clock. So uh, just I guess the, the folks at Eden, we're the odd, odd, odd people. We're meeting at 10 and 11. Uh, 10, I'm, I'm getting myself confused now. At 9 and 10, 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock is our worship on Sunday morning. Hope you'll come out and visit with us. Uh, but if you're in the Martinsville area, 823 Starling Avenue is where uh, the Saints meet there, and 120 American Legion in Danville is where the Saints meet there, and so we want you to, to go out and, and visit with them any chance you get. Also, remember, what does the Bible say? On WHIG-TV uh, out of Rocky Mount, North Carolina, starting next Thursday, uh, that's February the 6th, uh, what does the Bible say? We'll be coming on at 10 p.m., that's, that'll be following this program. Log in right quick over to WHIG-TV. If you're watching online, if you're watching us online, go over to WHIGTV.com, and, and uh, Brother Johnny Robertson will be live on Thursday nights from 10 to 1130. And so we want to uh, encourage you to, to, uh, to, to uh, catch that uh, um, Bible lesson with, uh, with him. As I said uh, earlier, our job is what we're talking about. Friends, I want you to consider, if you will, what it is that we are supposed to be doing. In, in the book of Ezekiel, this is where we want to start. I want to give you a Bible principle and then show you, let's make some application. That's really what our job is to do. So we want to teach you. Let's start, if you would, in Ezekiel 33. Now, we're not going to read the whole, whole uh, chapter, but that would have been an excellent chapter to read. But we're going to spend a great deal of time in Ezekiel 33. And I want you to consider how God viewed His spokesmen, His prophets of old, and their, uh, their obligation, if you will, to giving His message. Now today, we are preachers of the gospel. We're not prophets, but we are proclaiming the gospel. We're preaching. And uh, uh, Peter said, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. And so what we're doing is we are giving a message that God has given mankind and we are proclaiming it. But here's an illustration that God used <clears throat> to, to demonstrate Ezekiel's job and his relationship or his duties, if you will, to, uh, uh, to the people. Let's, let's, uh, let's get in our Bibles and let's begin in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 33. And uh, we're going to look in verse, we're going to just begin in verse 1 and, and, and we're going to read together here, all right? Ezekiel 33 and verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman. All right, he's setting up, he's setting up a job here. You're supposed to take someone, and they're supposed to be the watchman. And notice what it says. He says, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet, and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own hand. All right, if you hear the sound of the trumpet and you don't do anything, that's on you. He said, he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his, own, deliver his soul. So if you hear the sound and you do something about it, now you've saved yourself. Look at verse 6. He says, But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among uh, them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood shall I require at the watchman's hand. Now look at that. The individual who did not hear the warning because the watchman did not sound the warning, they're still going to die in their sins. He says, but I'm going to require his blood at the watchman's hand. You, he, he, should, he should have sounded the warning. Now, I'm saying this to show you 
that God painted a vivid picture for Ezekiel about what Ezekiel's job was, basically his job description, and that was to warn the people, okay? Now let's learn something about a watchman. What are, what are we talking about a watchman? A watchman is a military position. And it was someone who stood guard. They were selected to stand guard for the people. They were to stand guard and, and watch. And, and uh, if anything uh, came, then they were to blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. Now, in the Jews, the Jewish uh, dispensation, or under the Jews, they had three watches. They set three watches uh, during the night. One, uh, the Bible talks about the first, second, the first watch, the middle watch, and the, and the third watch, or the morning watch. Let's look at that, for example. Just to paint you the picture, we're trying to let the Bible uh, paint the picture for you. In Lamentations 2 and verse 19, here's an example. Uh, Lamentations 2, 19, Jeremiah says, Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches. Pour out thine heart like waters before the face of the Lord. So, in the night, in the beginning of the watches. Now, in, under the, the Jews, they had those three watches, and the first one began at sunset and ended around 10 o'clock, and then they had the middle watch, the second watch. Let's look at this. In Judges chapter 7 and verse 19. Judges 7 verse 19. So Gideon, now this is Gideon. We know how Gideon took 300 men and he defeated the, the Midianites. And so Gideon and the 100 men that were with him uh, came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. So the beginning of the middle watch is when they circled around the Midianites, all right? So there's two watches. Now, there's a third watch that we find in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 24. Exodus 13 uh, 14 and verse 24. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and a cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. So... In the, in the uh, morning watch, later on we're going to find out that it was, it was coming close to morning. So it was that third watch. Now, later on, when the, when the Romans came to power, the Romans set four watches. They had four watches in the night, three hours each. Whereas the Jews had uh, three four-hour watches, the Romans had four three-hour watches. So, but nonetheless, I want you to understand that this is what the watchman did. The watchman was standing guard while everybody else was going about their business or he, they were sleeping or what have you. And so the job was to warn them, wake them up, if you will. Awaken them up so they can take action and save themselves. And so there's the picture of the watchman. Now, I want you to notice something about Ezekiel and the watchman that God paints in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, let's look at the duty of the watchman. Now, we'll make some other points about the watchman, but I really want to focus on this one thing, the duty of the watchman. What is his job? What is his job? You know, we just read the first six verses of Ezekiel, but I want you to notice this. Ezekiel 1, excuse me, Ezekiel 33. Here is, here, here's, here's the watchman. The Lord says, Son of man, this is what it's going to be like. Uh, set the watch. But if you notice in these verses, in these nine verses, the first nine verses, uh, seven times God uses the word warn. Now that should tell you something about the watchman's job. That's his job description. That's his duty. Notice this. Uh, verse 3, when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows trumpet to warn the people. Then verse 4, whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning. See, the trumpet was sounded for a warning. All right? Verse 5, he said, he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. There's the warning. And then upon him, but he that taketh warning shall save his soul, shall deliver his soul. So there's two times uh, he sees the word warn or warning. Verse 6, uh, but the watchman seeth the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. All right? There's no warning given. Verse 7, thou, O son of man, God says to Ezekiel, now you are going to be the picture. You are the, the, the watchman. I painted you the picture. Ezekiel, you are the watchman. Your job is to do what? It's to warn them and warn them from me. Now we're getting to very specifics. God told Ezekiel, your job is to warn. All right, so we got warn in verse 3, warning in verse 4, Warn and warning in, in verse 5, that's, that's, that's uh, four times. Now we've got one in verse 6 and once in verse 7. And then we've got uh, in verse 8, Say unto the wicked, 
O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. All right, so your job is to warn. And now again in verse 9, he tells them, uh, if, thou warn, if thou warn the wicked of his ways to turn from it, if he turn not from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So here we have the, uh, the idea, the, the duty of this uh, watchman is to warn people, to sound out a warning. Now, friends, this is really a good picture of what our job is, too. Our job as gospel preachers is to warn individuals. It's to cry out. It's to make a warning for individuals. Uh, for, uh, 2 Timothy, let's look at this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, listen to what God says. I charge thee, this is what Paul says, God saying it through Paul, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. Now, what are we doing? What's the purpose of preaching? Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort our long-suffering and doctrine. Now, there is the warning. Reproof and rebukes. That's a warning. Those are words of warnings and admonitions. To tell people, look, you need to change. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to turn around. Here's why. Verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fable. But, but watch. He's a watchman. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. The preacher's job is to be an evangelist, and that means to cry out a warning, to stand on the watch, stand on the tower, and give a warning to individuals who are in sin and in iniquity to turn them from it. Now, that's our job. That's our job. Now, in recent days, we've all been, uh, we were, I think we've all been kind of shocked about uh, Larry the Atheist, who has been a very uh, prominent figure, you might say, on the, uh, uh, the local uh, uh, stations here and abroad. He's been given airtime to, to answer us countless of times. He's made uh, remarks that he hates us and so forth. But since he's passed, I want you to notice what has come to light. A lot of things has come to light about so-called pastors or preachers and what their job really is. Now, the other day, uh, Sunday night, Johnny and I took uh, took two uh, 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 we took two hour no hour and a half, and we sat down and we discussed we discussed the idea that uh, local uh, pat, uh, uh, pastors were not really doing their job. Now let's first find out let's first find out what they think their job is. Let's see what local pastors think their job is or how they're supposed to do their job. All right? Now, this is Pastor Jessica, and I have pastor in quotation marks. We know she's not really a pastor by biblical definitions because a pastor is uh, supposed to be the husband of one wife. I don't think she qualifies on that, that account. But nonetheless, she builds herself as a pastor. Now, listen, let her tell you what her job is. She's explaining her job. Okay, she's doing her job based upon the way she lives and Christ is coming through her. Now, friends, you can't find that in the Bible. You can't find where the pastor's job, the preacher's job, the evangelist's job, the watchman's job is to let Jesus come through them and say, well, you know what? So basically she's saying that Larry had the responsibility of just looking at Jessica and saying, you know what? I need to be like Jessica. She's not doing her job. See, that's what we're talking about. In, in this, in this, uh, uh, 
I heard it. Okay, I'll play it again. We're told not to get any sound on that clip. Um, someone let me know if you're if you're hearing the sound. We'll play it again. Okay. You know, pressing my views on someone who just chooses not to respond. I agree with that. I mean, I mean, people do but aren't you not doing your job if you don't like do a little... I'm doing my job. He's got to proselytize. He's got to preach to you. I'm Convert doing my you. job by being who I am and based on what I believe coming through me. All right. All right. So did you hear that? So her job is to let people see her and, and that's that's uh, her, her job is just basically to be an example. Now, friends, there's no doubt about it that the Bible talks about being an example of the believers, 1 Timothy 4 or 12. There's no doubt about it that we're supposed to be, be an example and, and the, th the things that we say and do are certainly supposed to, to uh, imitate Christ. And so and by that sense, we're being an example. But that's not the job. The job, the job that we have is to preach the gospel. Listen to what Paul's going to say. Paul's going to say this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, Paul says that, <clears throat> he says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. His job is to preach the gospel. He, he was, he was uh, uh, selected to go, and, to go and preach. Notice this, in Romans, Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, Romans 1 verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But notice what he says in the, in the preceding verses. If you back up a, a verse, he says in verse 14, he says, I'm, an, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And then he says, because the gospel is the power of God to save. So if you want to save somebody, it's not going to come because they see you and they say, well, I think I'm going to be saved. No, they're going to be saved because they heard the word that converts them and pricked their heart and they have then rendered obedience to that form of doctrine that was given them. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16, Paul says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether unto sin, uh, to uh, 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 sin unto death, or unto obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, now he's writing to the Romans, who are already Christians. He says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, which was delivered you. Friends, there's only one way you're going to obey a form of doctrine, and that is if it is delivered you. And the way the doctrine that saves is delivered to people is through the process of preaching the word and convicting people of their sins. That's what we're talking about here. Notice this in Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Notice this. Now, Paul says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, he's going to tell you how a person... It's supposed to call on the name of the Lord. How, are they, how do they come to call on the name of the Lord? And what is that calling on the name of the Lord? He says, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? So calling requires belief. But how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? So in order to, in order to believe, you've got to hear. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now when someone says, well, you know, you need to just call the name of the Lord and be saved. That's exactly right. And here's what calling on the name of the Lord means. It means to obey the gospel which you have heard, which you have then believed as a result of someone preaching the gospel to you. Now, when someone tells me, when a so-called pastor tells me they're doing their job by simply living a life in front of someone else, that's a far cry from what the Bible clearly outlines as the watchman's job. 
Our job is to proclaim the gospel that can save men's souls. And that means convicting them of error, showing them where they're wrong in the eyes of God. And you know what, friends? If a watchman fails to do that, the blood of those individuals that should have heard their cry is on their head. Now that is one thing, that is one thing that, that, you, don't, that you don't hear the, uh, the local pastor talking about. Notice, look at it again what Ezekiel said. He said, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood shall I require at thine hand. You know what, friends? The reason why, the reason why we are so hard on pastors and bishops and preachers and so-called evangelists and chief apostles of the world is because we know that they are not doing the job that they're supposed to do, number one. And number two, uh, even if they were preaching something or being proclaim, uh, proclaiming a message, it'd be the wrong message because it's not in the Bible. Now, this is why we're so hard on it. Now, I know Pastor, Pastor uh, Jessica G. Griffin, she says, you know, well, you know, people say, well, y'all, everybody's hard on me. You know what? If you want to step into the ring and be, a, and be someone who says, I'm going to be a proclaimer of God's word, then number one, you better make sure that what you're preaching and teaching is from God's Word. And if you can't stand the heat, you know, then what's the saying? Don't get in the kitchen. Listen, if you want to set yourself up as a, as a watchman, someone who is, is looking out for someone's souls, and as a matter of fact, that's what the word pastor actually means, is a shepherd, someone who's looking out for someone's souls, and you're not going to tell them the gospel you're not going to tell them what they must do to be saved. You're just going to say, well, I'm just going to let people see my example. You know? You're not doing your job. You're not doing your job. And the Bible says it's going to be on, on your hand. The blood of innocent people are going to be in your hand. You know why? That's why we're so hard on guys like Billy Graham. Billy Graham has led more people and will have led more people to hell than anybody in our lifetime because he is not telling them what they need to hear. He has set himself up as a watchman, as a proclaimer, as someone who is warning people that they need to change but not telling them what they need to do. See that? Now that's the duty that we're talking about. See, if you're going to convert individuals and you're going to save people from hell, then friends, what you are required to do is you're required to warn them. Even individuals that may be, well, they're good and honest folks. They're, they're good, upright people. They don't, they don't need to be warned of anything. You know what? If they're, not, if they're not in Christ, they're not in the body of Christ, they're not members of the church of Christ, which is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22, 23, and Ephesians 4, 4, and Ephesians 5, 23. That's the, the body. The church is the body, the body is the church. There's only one of them, Ephesians 4, 4, and Christ is the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the church. Now, if you're not telling people about that, and you're not trying to help people to, to, uh, to really get to heaven, you're actually standing on the wall, but you're not blowing the horn. You're content to let people say, well, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll get the warning some other way because you're sure not going to tell them. Let me tell you, good people need to be warned. Look at this. Look at this. In Acts 10 and verse 22, here was, here was a, a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a good man. For all practical purposes, Cornelius was a, was a good man. He, he's better than most people in our community, I would say. He would have been better. He would have been a great man in the community. Look at this. There was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man, one that feared God uh, with all his house, which gave alms to the people, and prayed, sorry about that, and prayed to God uh, uh, always. He saw in a vision, uh, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, the angel of the Lord coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and alms have been, heard, have been brought up for memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, 
and, he, and he's telling him where he's lodging. Now notice what, he, what he's going to tell him. He's going to tell thee what thou oughtest to do. He's going to tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now, let's skip down to verse 22 here. Whoops, verse 22. Acts 10, verse 22. Now, they said, now these are the men. He sends men down to get Peter and bring Peter back. And when they get to Peter's house, this is what they tell Peter. They said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God, and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned of God. He was warned of God. And what, did, what was going to satisfy that warning? He said he was warned of God to send for thee so that he could hear words of thee. And Peter's going to say in Acts 11 and verse 14 that they were words whereby Cornelius was going to be saved. But notice, it was a warning from God. And the warning was going to come in the form of preaching from Peter. This is what you need to do. Peter was going to sound out the trumpet. This is what you need to do. If Peter had not have gone to Cornelius, if Peter had not told Cornelius what he must do to be saved, if he had not given him the words whereby he uh, uh, could be saved, he would not have done his job. Cornelius' uh, blood would have been on his own hand, or on his hands. So Cornelius was warned. Noah was warned. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Notice this. By faith Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, and moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his, of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah was warned of God. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness who went about warning other people. How do I know? Because Noah was giving a message that God was going to destroy the world. Now, friends, you tell me. Do you think Noah would have done his job? Would, would have been considered uh, uh, Noah uh, being faithful to his duty? If he had not have been preaching and telling people, warning people that the flood was coming? You know what? I, I can imagine Noah going, okay, the Lord's going to send a great flood. I'm going to build this ark. And when someone says, what are you building this big boat for? I'm going to tell them, just look at me. Just look at me. And you'll be saved. But why are you building that ark? Well, just look at me. Can't you tell why I'm building an ark? Just look at me. Just look at me. No. Friends, he had to give a warning. He had to tell them. The destruction of the world's coming. You need to get on the boat. Oh, but you know what? That might have hurt somebody. That might have hurt somebody's feelings to tell them they need to get on that boat. Maybe they didn't want to get on that. Maybe they wanted the boat of their own choice. You know? Maybe they wanted, maybe they wanted to go to the Baptist bass boat or something. I don't know. You know, I, I, I like my Baptist bass boat over here. You know? I like my Lutheran lifeboat. You know? I, I don't know. You see, Pentecostal pontoon, yeah, whatever we're talking about, you know. Pentecostal party boats, remember more what it's like. But see, see what? No, but you had to warn individuals. Now, friends, this is my, my point. Noah would not have done his job if he had not a preached, and he was a preacher of righteousness. And so what he was doing was he was warning people. Now, that word warn in Acts 10, verse 22, and Hebrews 11, verse 7, is a word that means to utter an oracle. These were divine messages of warning. And they were followed up by further instructions about what people must do to be saved, to be spared from the, from the destruction that's coming. Now, when you look at what Ezekiel is saying, Ezekiel 33, he says, the watchman sees the sword coming and his job is to blow the horn, sound the trumpet, and give people warning so they can save themselves. Friends, if you do not tell someone that they are lost, if you do not tell someone they're in danger, you cannot say that you're doing your job. Now, we know what our job is. Our job is to warn people. Look at this in Colossians 1 and verse 28. Colossians 1 and verse 28. 
Paul said, whom we preach. He's talking about Christ. To my Christ. All right? God is going to make known the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. And he says, whom we preach. They're preaching Christ. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that he may... Uh, that he may present that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You got to warn people, not well. Just let them look at me. No. Even if you got a new dress for every day of the year, that's not going to tell them what they must do to be saved. You've got to warn people, and that's what our job is. Now, let me say, I'm going to come back to some of this. I'm going to come back to some of this because we're talking about warning people. Now, listen to this. Now. Pastor Jessica R., she says her job is to let people see her. Now, Pastor Jessica Griffin, G., she says that we're not doing our job because all these people supposedly are, are not following us. That's the criteria. Let's look at this. Let's listen to this one. And, and let me just say for the record, Charles, I was, I was shocked. I'm still shocked, um, sad. It's always sad when someone loses their life. Yeah. Uh, but it, I tell you, today, I'm just still shocked. And you know, Johnny Robertson uh, did a show last mm -hmm. night criticizing you and Jessica Robertson. And I'm trying to understand that. Why was he criticizing us? He said, y'all didn't, didn't do enough. <laughs> we didn't do enough. Well, I tell As you, preachers, so but this is what I say to Johnny. I, okay, he doesn't do enough. Because if he was doing enough, there'd be a lot of people on his side. So clearly, he, to me, that he, it's his opinion, is his opinion because we can only give the message. We can't, I can't tell Dick, Dick, you need to follow Christ. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He's going to save you. It's up to Dick to want to take that message and live by it. So to me, that's hogwash. And even with Johnny Robinson preaching what he does. Mm -hmm. Dick, do you follow Johnny? Nope. Do you follow Johnny? Do you follow Johnny? I listen to what he says. You listen to what he says, but are you following the Church of Christ? No. Nope. Well, Johnny Robinson, you're not doing your job. <laughs> oh, 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 my goodness. <laughs> Jonathan, are you following Johnny? Yeah, I can Raise your hand. Anybody following Johnny? Brian, you following Johnny? He's saying if we don't sign up to it right now, he's not doing the job. I'm making a point more or less. Okay. He's saying that we're not doing... No, she's not making a point. See, she's missing the point. Our point is not telling people, you need, you know, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Our point is telling people that if you're not following Jesus Christ, if you're not doing what the Bible says, then you need to repent. Now, here's some specifics. You know what? You can't go out and get drunk every night. You can't be shacking up every night. You can't be in a church that's not in the Bible. You've got to do things that are in, that in our accordance with the Word of God, not contrary to it. Not just tell people, oh, Jesus loves you. That's not warning people. See, you've got to tell them to stop doing things that are dangerous to them, that are harming their soul. And here's the criteria, Jessica. It's not how many people follow Johnny or follow James, our job is not to follow and get people to follow us, it's to get them to follow Christ. Now, but if you just want to look at individuals who have followed, now let's just let's just take a few notes here. You know, let's just take a few notes here. If you do a little uh, quick survey here, here's what I think you'll find, Jessica. I think you'll find that as a result of us being on the, the air and us being in association with Star News, what we have done is we've had, we've seen three producers obey the gospel. Two of their wives have obeyed the gospel. Had Bible studies with uh, at least at one other that I know of and uh, Two of them have actually come to service several times. So it's not, it's not as much as we're keeping score for that, but just to show you that, yes, we're having influence on people. And yes, they are watching. And yes, they're learning. Because what we're giving them is the Word of God that can save their souls. Now, like you said, what they do is up to them. But what we were saying about you not doing your duty is you're not giving them what they need. See, you're not giving them what they need. And so that's why we're saying none of these pastors, preachers, bishops, rabbis, whoever are doing their job because they're not giving people what they need. We're not trying to get people to follow us. We're trying to get people to follow Christ. So, 
So as a, as a matter of, of fact, you know, we have had individuals obey the gospel. We have individuals uh, have heard the message, heard the warning. Sounded, we sounded the trumpet and they heard it. Now, if they want to keep obeying it, keep following it, keep heeding the warning, that's, that's on them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they have heard the warning. They have heard the sound. But what have they heard from you? I guarantee you that most of these preachers, including Jessica, the only horn they're blowing is not a horn of warning. It's just tooting their own horn. You know, look how many clothes we've got in our closet. You know, my daddy licensed me, contrary to what the Bible says. That's what you get from them. So here's what we're saying. You need to understand what the Bible says about your duty if you're going to be a, a pastor, if you're going to be a preacher. And that goes for anybody, not just not just uh, uh, these so-called women preachers. But you need to understand what the job requirement is as set forth in the Bible. Now, let me say this. Larry, the atheist, he understood our job. He understood our job. He understood what our job was. Now, right after Jessica said, Jessica R., Pastor Jessica R., said her her duty was to, her job was to just, you know, let people see her. Here's what Larry said. Here's what Larry said. Understanding full well what our job was. Don't so, you think Johnny that, and them, He said that my husband's nice. I'm nice. That's doing my job. Okay, but don't you, you know? think Johnny and them believe that it's their job to save you from hell and they're preaching all the time and if they see you doing something off, they've got to tell you, don't you feel like they're committed? They don't believe like you do. Johnny Robertson, James Oldfield, Mark McManus, and Micah and Caleb, Definitely they believe they've the got same. to convert you. Mm-hmm. They've got to save you from hell. And if they don't, they're not doing their job. That's the yeah. way they feel. Okay. I don't know how they feel. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how you feel because I studied, I mean, you know I studied I mean? them all the time. I mean, you don't I watch their shows. No, I don't. I don't. Well, see, how can you know how they feel? I, mean, I know no, how they no, feel. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Exactly know. Feel I, mean, you, I, mean, I, I know exactly how you feel because I studied them. I mean, I know exactly how you feel because I studied them. I mean, I know exactly how you feel because I studied them. Larry knew exactly how we feel. He knew exactly what our job was because he studied us. He watched. He listened. He heard the trumpet. Now, remember what Ezekiel said. Ezekiel said, if you, if you hear the trumpet, if you hear the trumpet and uh, you don't do anything about it, that's, that's not on me. Listen, if, if someone hears the trumpet, whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood is up on his own hand. Listen, I don't have any, I don't lose any sleep about the fate of Larry. Oh, it troubles me. It saddens me. But as far as my conscience, Larry knew exactly what we taught. He knew exactly what the Bible said. He was exposed to it time and time again. That's why I'm saying, friends, we did our job. We did our duty. We sounded the warning countless times, countless times. And I hate to see the the loss of, of anybody. You know, the death of anybody who dies outside the Lord. But the bottom line is, we're making sure that individuals who go on into eternity, that they heard the sound of the trumpet. They heard the sound of the trumpet. Okay, let's take a phone call. You're on the word of the Lord. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayfield. How are you doing today? All right, this is Charles. Okay. Uh, um... Now, me, I support my friend, Miss Griffin, to 100% on what she does because I will stand by my friends and defend them the best way I can on what okay. they do. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question then. Are you going to stand beside her on the judgment day? If I have to, I will. Well, here's, what I, here's why I ask that. Because she claims, let's just take a few examples here. She claims to be a preacher, which the Bible says... She's not authorized to do. So she's contrary to what God says. Now, do you still want to be beside her on the Day of Judgment? Yes, I will because she's a friend, and I will stand with my friends. I don't abandon. Well, you know what, sir? Here's here's what makes me sad about that is 
I won't go to hell for anybody. I'm not going to go to hell for anybody. I don't care how good a friend they are. I'm not going to go to hell for them. If they're doing something contrary, if they're doing something contrary to what the Bible says, I would not be a friend if I didn't tell them. All right. Now, here's what Paul said. Here's here's what Paul said. Go ahead. Uh, but like it is, that's how I am. Well, I don't abandon my friends and. But here's Mr. Griffin has always been a good friend, and I always will stand beside my friends. Okay, but do Not you understand? Abandoned. But but do you understand what I'm saying to you? What I'm saying to you is, just, you may say she's a friend. You may say she's a friend, and that's fine. But if you were a friend, you would make sure that what she's saying, and what she's doing, what she's practicing, you'd make sure that what she's doing is in accordance with the Bible. Now, are you really a good friend if you're not if you're not telling her that she's doing something contrary to what the Bible says? Listen, in Galatians, in, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, a, a real friend, a real friend is going to say, Friend, what you're doing is contrary to what the Bible says. Now, yeah. who, who's like it? it is. Like it is. I stand beside my friend, Miss Griffin, and what she's doing if she thinks she's doing the right thing, and I will stand beside her on it. Well, don't you think it's more okay. important? Don't you think it's more important to know that what you're doing is right than rather than to think what you're doing is right? Well, I believe she's doing the right thing. How do you How do you know she's doing I right? I feel about it. How do you know she's because doing I right? Because I believe so. How do you because know she's I believe doing so. right? How do you know? I believe so. But why do you she believe? So. Fact, listen, believe. Belief comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, how do you? How? Why do you believe? It? Did you hear God say she's doing right? So that that's my point. All right, all right. Thanks for your call. See, friend, this is my. This is my, this is why it's so important that what we're doing is being very distinct and plain and bold is because some individual says, well, I just believe it. I just think it. I feel it. Friends, I don't want you to believe it, think it, feel it. I want you to know it because of what the Bible says. Hebrews 11, verse 6, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, uh, excuse me, Romans 10, 11, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you didn't hear God say it, why would you believe it? Why would you have faith in it? Why would you have confidence in it? You're on the word of the Lord. Yeah, I'm still here. Hello? You're on the air. Uh, I just want to say you're doing a fine job. I believe everything you're saying because I see it on the screen. And when them preachers say you don't have to do nothing, they're lying because Noah had to build a boat. Exactly right. And he believed God to build a boat. That's exactly right. That's, That's all I wanted to say. I appreciate y'all. All right. Thanks for your call. Thank you. All right. Now, here's, here's, here's what we want to say, friends. You know, we don't enjoy pointing out error. It's, it's not something you relish, but if you love somebody's soul, won't you tell them right? Don't, won't, you, won't you tell them so? If you saw your friend, if you really loved your friend, and you saw them going down the road where the bridge is washed out, and you knew that there wasn't a, there wasn't any other warning sign other than the fact that you know the bridge is out. Wouldn't you flag them down and stop them and tell them, stop, don't go that way. Friends, I, I'm not going to stand. I'm not going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ with anybody just because they're my friend. Now, I hope to have a lot of friends by me on the day of judgment. But I'm not going to stand beside them right or wrong and say, oh, they're my friend. I'm going to stand beside them. I'm going to go to hell for you. No, I'm not going to go to hell for anybody. Now, friends, this is what we want you, want you to see. When individuals know they haven't warned, when they, when they know that they haven't warned the, 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 the erring from, uh, uh, from the error of their ways, they try to pacify themselves. Now, I'm going to say Pastor Jessica's trying to wash her, wash the blood off her hand. Remember Ezekiel said the blood's on their own hands? Let's look at this. This is, this is a statement, this is a statement that, uh, that is made about 
what happened, what, what she thinks happens, happened uh, right before uh, Larry the Atheist died. All right? The audio? Okay. We, you know, people say, oh, you people are they're tired of this topic. But, you know, it's one of the top topics there is, is there heaven or hell. It, and it absolutely is. Yeah. And I mean, even Charles, as of yesterday, and I know this has nothing, it does coincide with the Grammys. Everyone's up in arms about even the Grammys. And mm -hmm. so it's ironic that we're talking about Larry Serber today and then what Johnny Robertson just said. Mm -hmm. And even though, you know, I disagree with Johnny on a lot of things, one thing that I can say is when you ask him the question about heaven or hell, mm -hmm. I'm a believer that I feel that because we don't know where he went, and I've seen people at the last end of their life accept Jesus Christ or, or, or say, Lord, help me. Mm -hmm. So even though he wasn't a believer in God, as he would say, we don't know what his minutes were or his moments were, you know, before he passed away. So it's... it's All right. She says, she says, we don't know. Well, you know, friends, I, I think we ought to just let... You know, let the people that know say. And who better to know than Larry himself? You know what? Larry was an atheist. He, he, you heard him earlier say, I'm, I'm an atheist. I, I'm an atheist. There's no doubt about it. Now, friends, I don't want to, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a shame and a sham and a sin, really, to try to pacify yourself. And, well, maybe he said a prayer. Well, that wouldn't even salve my conscience if I hadn't told him the truth. Because a prayer is not going to get somebody to heaven. Saying a prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, that's not going to get anybody to heaven. I don't care if it's on your deathbed or, or your, you know, your sofa. It, it's, it's not going to get you to heaven. But listen to this. Listen to this. I told Charles a thing, and I think he was telling Johnny about it, but he, he got it a little mixed up. I was telling him when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my house, I always play with them a little bit. You know, kind of like um, God was playing with Abraham, telling him to kill his son Isaac. I was just messing with you, the angel. How, what a horrible person Abraham would have been if, they, if there was a God. He told me to kill my daughter that I love and who trusts me. I'd say, sorry, God, old boy. You're going to have to burn me in hell to, forever to a cinder because I ain't going to kill my daughter. I mean, these monsters, you know, just, just, just crazy people like this. I mean, just, it, goes, it goes on and on. When you're desperate, but anyway, my little experiment. The, the uh, I think Charles said something to Johnny about it. it was the bicycle riding Mormons? No, it was actually Jehovah's Witnesses. And every once in a while, they would come on a Sunday morning to my home, and usually they'd get me just before I was going out jogging. And I know all my neighbors, just about all of them are Baptist. A couple of them are, are you know, non-believers like me, but most of them are Baptist. Not too serious, but and so they won't let Jehovah's Witnesses in their house. But I do. I, I want them to come in because I want to talk to them about their religion and how nutty he is. So a couple of times over the years, I got into a real um, animated discussion with some of those Jehovah's Witnesses. And I remember one particular time. It was a former student of mine, real sweet little girl. But I was telling her, if you, you know, if you had a baby and it was bleeding and you weren't going to take it to the hospital for a blood transfusion, I'd try to take it away from you and get that blood transfusion to save it. She got mad. Finally, it got really bad, and I said, I can prove there's no God. And she, this girl, and this Pakistani-looking man that was her mentor, they said, well, you can prove it. I said, it's not going to be pretty, and you're not going to like it. It's probably going to upset you. So we go outside, and they're out in my parking area. I went up on, I have a ladder that goes up from my deck to my roof. I went up on the roof and stood up on the highest, most dangerous part of the peak of my roof on one foot. And I looked up, and I said, Yahweh, you punk, strike me dead. Make me blind. Give me pancreatic cancer. Well, by this time, they were running to the car. They opened the doors and they dive in the car. And they're tearing up spinning gravels out of my driveway. And they hit the main road. It sounds like they're accelerating, winding that car out in a drag race. It's hilarious to me because I know Jehovah's Witnesses have been told, when you come into a non-believer's house, watch out. I've tried to give them books before and they won't take them because they've been told that, you know, you'll pick up demons like that. So as I say, so exhilarating to me. And do you think I would do a stupid thing like challenge God if I thought there was one quadrillionth chance there was such a God? I know there's not. I've been doing that kind of thing for 55 years. It's just stupid. Now, if there happens to be some kind of God, you know, and I die, then I'm really in big trouble. Okay. If there happens to be a God, when he dies, he's in big trouble. You know what, friends? The sad part about it is 
the warning was given. The warning was given. And, you, you know, friends, I want to say this. What troubles me even more, it's not that individuals have heard or not heard. What troubles me is that people have heard and heard and heard and heard the truth. They've heard the trumpet sound. And they're still not listening. They're still not listening. Now they may look at, they may look at the life of Larry Serber and know that he was the avowed atheist, agnostic, whatever. And they say, that's pretty sad. But you know what else is sad? Let's skip down to the end. I'm coming to the end of my time. But I want you to look at Ezekiel 33 and verse 30. You know what God tells Ezekiel? In 33 and verse 30, he says this. He says, also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the, by the walls and in the doors of their houses and speak one to another, every one to his, to, uh, to his brother saying, Come, I will pray you, come, I pray you, and hear what the word that cometh forth from the Lord is. Now look at this, verse 31. He says, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as thy people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. There's a lot of individuals that we meet, and they say, oh, we love what you're doing, we love what you're doing. Yeah, y'all preaching truth, preaching truth. But you're not doing them. You're not doing them. You're just like the individuals that hear the horn blowing, and you're saying, I'm still not going to do it. And look what he says. He says, Ezekiel, you are like someone who's playing a very lovely song, one that's a pleasant voice. He says that you're just, you're just playing away. Oh, that's good, but they're not going to do them. All you good friends out there who love what we're saying, yeah, you know, preaching truth, if you want to obey the gospel, you are just someone who hears the horn blowing. and you say, oh, that's a pretty sound. That sound you're hearing is the trumpet sound. It's a warning sound. And we want you to obey the gospel. We want you to hear the horn because it's blowing and you don't know when the trumpet's going to stop and the Lord's going to come. Friends, hope we helped you. If we can help you and assist you in any way, we want you to do that very thing. We want you to know that we love you, we appreciate you, and we hope that we can help you uh, any way we can. Remember, a word from the Lord uh, every night, Thursday night at 9 p.m. Till next time, have a good night. at this